What is this mantis protesting? Why did I feel the need to blur this image? And oh god, what is that Pokemon? You're about to find out in The Insect Book by Simon Leather. Trust me when I say our homie Simon Leather does not skimp on the good stuff. I knew this would be a wild ride by how often the man basically told me he was an aphid addict. The start of the book is a lot about their anatomy and stuff, which was interesting to be fair. Insects don't have lungs. What the fuck? but it's a bit much for this video. The answer to your important questions are, they do have a dick and balls. Girl bugs don't have tits though, so male bugs are all ass guys. You're welcome. Our boy literally has a chapter called Prolific Procreators, which I adore. In it, he talks more about aphids, which can give birth to live young, apparently. Not only that, the adult aphids contain live young like a, these are his words, living Russian doll. Not all insects have to bang to reproduce, so even the incels of insects can have kids, which might explain why there are so many dang bugs. Insects have a lot of different mating strategies, my favorite being the swarm technique, which often occurs at the top of a hill or above a human head. Remember that the next time you're thinking about swatting that swarm of gnats, they're just trying to get their ediagus wet like the rest of us. We all know about the male praying mantis getting eaten when they sex, but according to Dr. Leather, this isn't necessarily their preferred outcome. Girl, that ostium bursae is fire, but I ain't gonna die for it. I laid 30% more eggs if you do. I think it might actually be better if I try to mate with another. So, what do adult aphids and vaporeons have in common? No, I'm not talking about the extensive writings about their sex lives. I'm talking about selective evolution. Did you know baby aphids develop different traits based on their environment? In 1970, a fellow aphid connoisseur discovered the black bean aphid has three different evolved forms, the migrants, the flyers, and the non-flyers. It was later found that the migrants had less ovioreals ovarial than the non-flyers, which had the most, and that less ovarials made them more likely to fly. The state of the host plant determines the likelihood of a migrant aphid spawn. So if the host plant sucks ass, there will be more aphids trying to fly away from it to find a better one. However, since only 0.3% of the migrants survive, it makes sense for aphids to not put all their chips in that basket. As it turns out, most insects are herbivores, or as Dr. Leather puts it, they're predators of plants. That's not something I'd considered, Doc, so I kind of appreciate your pedantry. This predation doesn't stop at the soft, juicy apple sitting on your kitchen counter, though. It extends as far as the tough bark on a tree. But this isn't fucking Minecraft. You can't just punch a tree and call it a day, so how do they do it? Many insects that feed on tough tissue have metal ions in their mandibles. This development does not come for free though. You have to make sacrifices to have metal jaws. In this case, it's the extra nutrients that are required in order to get them. But the plant that is being munched on... Not right now, Cooper. But the plant that is being munched on obviously doesn't want to be munched on, so what do they do? Well, the hardened bark didn't keep the bugs out, so it starts producing a potent poison. This slows the bugs down for a while, but nature always finds a way, and soon the insects begin producing enzymes that digest the poison. This process of prey developing defenses and then predators overcoming them is called the coevolutionary arms race. This development of specialization is why ecosystems can collapse if one important species disappears. Let's say the predator ant from above goes extinct because an aphid is introduced that eats them. I don't actually know if aphids can eat ants, but bear with me. In this case, not only does the ant die off, so do two other species of insects, one being the mites that live on the ants, the other a small insect that feeds on the dung of the ant because they don't have the iron mandibles to eat the plant. And now that the plant has no predators, it's able to grow far and wide, strangling a few other plant species in the process, which in turn hinders the bugs that fed on those species. From one species going extinct, you may see the collapse of an entire ecosystem due to the specializations acquired in the arms race. Of course, over a long enough time, the niches will be filled again, but evolution is not a fast process. Now, would it really be an insect book if we didn't talk about bees? Not many insects work together, but there are some like bees, ants, and termites that do. And they have surprisingly complex social structures. Female honeybees are divided into five different castes based on their age. The queen, the maid, the babysitter, the fast food worker, and the forager. There's also the undertakers and guards, but they're small groups. Then there are the males who don't work, spending all their time eating honey and waiting to mate. Ah, to live like that. 
This next phenomenon is very rare, but tantalizingly interesting. Pymphagene aphids are known for their gall forming activities. Here's the thing though, being closer to the base of the leaf is better, but not many can fit there. So what do you do when the prime real estate is limited? You either A, get there first, or B, go to war with the aphids who got there first. And these aren't like the school-wide brawls that used to happen in my private school. Nah, these are vicious battles, sometimes lasting up to two full days. And not only that, once Mother Nature saw the unbridled content that was being generated by these dudes, she decided that the babies in a related species would need to get in on it too. Some aphid babies are born with thicker legs and these act as soldiers, defending their siblings from invaders. These aphids are literally living in Call of Duty multiplayer, just spawning and going straight to the front lines to kill or be killed. Wild. Crushing enemies with their thunder thighs is not their only defense though. They can also do what is called dropping when they come face to face with a foe, which is basically a fake suicide off the tree. Another eyebrow razor is that they can shoot a quick hardening wax out of their abdomen to gum up a foe's mouth. What the hell? Alright, believe it or not, none of that stuff was what I referenced in the beginning. We've made it to the point in the book that I referenced early on, page 50 fucking 5. Hold on to your backside. So, not all aphids require defense mechanisms. I'm referring to the aphids that live with ants. If you haven't heard, ants will live symbiotically with aphids because aphids produce honeydew that the ants eat. This honeydew comes from an enlarged anal plate and is stored on hairs around the anal plate. The honeydew is aphid feces. These ants are literally dingleberry farmers. Now, Dr. Leather was kind enough to include some photos of the aphids' trophobiotic organs. Look at the tuna can on that guy in the middle. Jesus Christ. Not helping with that caption either, Dr. Leather. We gotta censor that hog. Ah, much better. Despite us only being halfway through the book, I'm calling it there. That's right, I'm leaving it at ants being dingleberry farmers and with aphid butt pics as the last image in your mind. Actually, I lied. Here's Morgan's Sphinx Moth. That's its godforsaken Darwin-predicted fucking tongue. Bye.